Hello, everyone. Welcome to this new webinar uh, from JOR, together with uh, uh, Alice Namuli from Lex Africa and uh, Madeline, um, who is from uh, iResolve, uh, co founded, I mean, founded iResolve. So, our pleasure to connect again with the African community uh, since we had a very successful uh, webinar uh, one month back. And it's really a pleasure to connect uh, again all together. Uh, this format will be slightly different from the past webinar because we decided uh, to tackle some of the questions that uh, asked us during the, the first webinar session. And uh, so we decided that, uh, you know, we had uh, really, we were really overwhelmed by your, by your response. So we decided to actually tackle some of these questions uh, today in this separate format. Of, co of course, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, asks uh, further questions you can uh, use the uh, question tab to to ask those we'll uh, try to address them as they come uh, so today uh, joining the panel uh, we have of course alice and uh, madeline and also our ceo alessandro palombo and uh, luigi cantisani who's our legal engineer i'm luca daniel i'm the cto of jor and today i will be moderating this session uh, since uh, uh, it's really a pleasure for me to connect with the African community, uh, the, the real good vibe that we perceived in the first session. It was really uh, overwhelming and, you know, good uh, to see that. Okay, so today uh, we'll be going through uh, the set of questions which were asked uh, in the first webinar. Uh, so I'll start um, with the first one, uh, which uh, uh, was... Uh, regarding the most of the question actually were regarding the ADR and the online dispute resolution uh, field. That's why uh, we asked kindly to Alice uh, to involve also, you know, um, her colleague uh, Madeleine because uh, uh, she's an expert in ODR and maybe we'll ask even further uh, to her uh, regarding an experience with iResolve, which is very interesting because it's an ODR uh, in Tanzania. So, you know, it's really interesting for, to, to share that kind of experience. Okay, I'll start with you, Luigi. Uh, so the question uh, that was asked in the past webinar was, how are smart contracts enforced by an ADR uh, system? So for answering this question, I will assume that uh, the person who asked uh, is including both traditional ADR and maybe also uh, ODR, so the branch of ADR that can be provided online. Okay, the point is that when we deal with smart contracts, we need to carefully look at what kind of obligations are automated and what obligations are, obligations are not automated. Smart contracts are software that provide automation. So when you ask how can we enforce uh, smart contracts well we are basically talking about enforcing obligations supported by smart contract software the point is smart contracts are meant to automate obligations which means that enforcement should come let's say automatically okay the parties are bound to certain conditions the parties are supposed to perform something. There are oracles that we mentioned in our first webinar, and oracles can be um, both human and machines, and oracles serve as validator for the obligation. So uh, in a perfect scenario, okay, obligations assisted by smart contracts should be automatically enforced but let's assume that the party are very let's say negligent and they do not perform so it's not a matter of validating what they've done checking if everything is correct if there is a delay and stuff like that it's something deeper okay how can you enforce this kind of obligation well this is the tricky uh point if you rely on traditional adr so you know let's say mediation conciliation arbitration you're still mm, relying on 
human decision makers, but then you have something that happens outside the blockchain, outside the, the platform that uses smart contracts. So you also need to rely on the party's intention to execute the decision, okay? ADR can provide for decisions, but then it's up to the parties to commit. And that, as we all know, does not necessarily happen. So, ideally, the best way to enforce smart contract is having an online, a built-in online dispute resolution system. So, something that is connected to those smart contracts. So, let's say that you are uh, basic, basically you have some you are debating on a sum okay and you don't know how the sum should be allocated because you say hey i delivered just part of the uh, of the goods that i was supposed to deliver but uh it's because of this and because of that uh you cannot blame me for that stuff like that on the other guy is oh but mm, you know this was not exactly what we agreed if the sum, if the agreed sum is somehow locked on the platform, it's easy, it's easy to enforce the decision because the, the decision, so the, out, the output of the decision making process will serve as an input for the smart contract so that the sum would be automatically allocated. The idea is if you have an embedded system um, dispute resolution system, it's easy to allocate sums. Okay, because it's all, you know, bound to the same platform, both the contractual relationship and also the the dispute. That makes a lot of sense, Luigi. Um, what instead of you know cases in which uh, there is no escrow and you know um, there is no like an automated way. Uh, to which you know the enforce like the decision can be actually enforced. Uh, how should uh, a party go about you know uh, solving a, such a complex dispute, right? Because you don't have uh, actually any way of uh, moving funds from one part to the other. Okay, this is something really interesting, and I believe that by answering this question, I will be also answering to following questions in advance. The, because it's all connected, you know, it's all connected. One point leads to the next one. I believe that the, for very complex contractual relationships where not all the obligations can be automated and you need a more complex decision-making process and maybe you also need a decision that, you, that can be easily enforced. Well, not easily, but, you know, more efficiently something that has the same strength uh, as uh, decisions adopted by domestic cards, maybe you need to rely on arbitration. And if you go, if you rely on arbitration, okay, let's say that you have a huge deal and part of the obligations are supported by smart contracts and other obligations are not supported by smart contracts. But if you have an arbitrary if you go with arbitration if at the end of the day you have an arbitral award you can enforce and even if this does not happen online on the platform you have a strong decision okay you have a strong decision so like it happens with other kind of relationships that are also managed online you know you can always ask for refund of the amount or you know you can ask for uh, having actions, okay, that can somehow fix, revert the outcome of the contractual relationship that failed, that did not work. But it's important at this point having a strong decision, something, you know, that can be enforced. Yeah. So even if it does not happen online, but you have something that is strong and you can revert. Yeah, it makes sense. And, you know, uh, this is like a field which is in its infancy. So, uh, you know, we pretty much still need to figure it out the best way, most probably to to handle and address this kind of disputes. So it's very interesting, uh, your point of view. Thanks, Luigi. 
On a very, um, you know, close note, uh, Alex, and this question is more for Alessandro, um, you know, it's um, smart contracts, um, basically they are, uh, you know, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a software in the end, which is, you know, deployed and uh, on a distributed network. And, you know, it, it can for, Till a certain extent, it can reproduce, like you know, the, the obligations and you know the contractual terms of a normal traditional contract, like a paper contract. But it's not as you know flexible, powerful, um, you know, as a paper contract from a certain point of views. For example, um, you know, one point which uh, on which the smart contract is not that flexible is changing the terms and the conditions of of a smart contract, right? When when you have instead of paper contract, then you can always, you know, amend it if your counterparty agrees and you can, you know, uh, put an annex to, to the contract or you can redraft it and so on and so forth. I would like to know, given also, you know, the, the insights from Luigi on the, on the dispute resolution side of a smart contract, how can someone go on changing the terms and the conditions of a smart contract, how that process would work. Thanks a lot, Luca, for this question. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be here today. Thanks again, Elise and Madeleine, for this um, uh, nice chance to, to have this chat together. So with regard to the, the question that you're asking me, Luca, um, I mean, the core point of a smart contract, as you said, is it's that uh, it's uh, really reliable, essentially, because it's a chain of events and this chain can be broken which means that it's simple software executing let's say uh, I mean um, consequence of events and predetermined uh, facts uh, as you notice uh, this opens to uh, I mean huge opportunities on one hand but also some limits on the other hand there is no paper contract to be interpreted and or, or eventually uh, we can't send a paper letter or an email to the counterparty and agree after the, I mean, agree in, in written terms some modifications of the contract. We can't do that. So um, on a general level, these are problems of smart contracts. So on a general level, I can say that if you have to uh, change the terms of, of, of a, an agreement that originally was uh, dis, dis, uh, disciplined in a in a, in a smart contract, you have to deploy a new smart contract. That's the first answer. Uh, there might be some exception where the smart contract is developed embedding some specific you know, chances or windows of opportunity for the parties to insert, to uh, input certain data at a later stage during the execution. Example, where the smart contract says that in case of both of the parties agree, the deadline and the let's say the termination of the contract will be postponed of one week one month one year in that specific case if the original smart contract provides this window let's say special window of modification self-modification in theory it's possible but uh, i mean at this stage i think you can confirm quite well luca um the, the technology and uh, essentially also i mean the uh, the code that we use for, I mean, coding smart contracts, it's, it's quite complicated. So uh, in general terms, it's not really recommendable to uh, build really complex architectures on smart contracts because they, I mean, some problems might arise. So uh, we are still not so, I mean, if you remember the famous uh, case of DAO, and, and the problem that arose, I mean, they, they were in that case. I, I think those problems have to be still solved. So at this stage, the, the, the answer should be, you want to change the terms, you have to deploy a new smart contract again. This is an interesting topic because it shows us how, I mean, uh, this technology is still in a infancy, uh, which shouldn't be you know, considered uh, in, a, in a bad way, on the opposite. Uh, I mean, it's like to be 1995, 1990, depends on the perspective for the internet. So there is a new world to be built. And at this stage, this is the, I mean, the, at least the, the current scenario. And uh, if you want to modify, deploy a new one. 
makes a lot of sense. And of course, uh, I'm the only computer scientist in the panel today. So I can confirm that, uh, yes, uh, when you do need to change conditions uh, in, a, in a smart contract, uh, ideally, you know, it's like creating a, basically a new contract until unless, you know, you have thought beforehand that certain uh, aspects of the contract could change to, during its, uh, its existence. So um, totally agreed on that, uh, Ale. And uh, on this topic, I would like to involve also Alice and Madeline because, um, you know, one, one, one interesting question that we received uh, from the community uh, was the following. Um, like, what has been your experience in situation of breach of terms in smart contracts? And, you know, we all know that, I mean, I'm not sure about uh, the situation in Uganda and Tanzania, but I think uh, you know, the adoption of this technology, it's still uh, to, 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 you know, to become true. So I'm, I think and assume that there is yet not been any dispute of a, of a smart contract. That's my uh, assumption. So I, I'm, I'm asking you if any sort of that case has already happened in Uganda and Tanzania and, you know, how uh, it went in case it, it happened or if it didn't happen, uh, from your perspective, we'll start with you, Alice, and then we'll move with Madeline. Uh, how someone should go about, you know, addressing uh, an issue ca coming from basically a piece of so software that no one can change? What's your thought on those? Well, like you've said, thank you, Luca. Like you've said, um, in Uganda, we've not had a dispute uh, in regard to smart, smart contracts yet. Um, I know for certain uh, people, of course, who use the 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 platform, these platforms that uses uh, blockchain or businesses that use these platforms, they've had uh, I would say misunderstandings. But because no, there's no uh, justice system that is able to interpret um, these these kind of contracts, most people just find a way of actually solving this. Uh, these disputes or misunderstandings within, like for example, if it's uh, you have two businesses and both of them are using that technology, the best way is basically sitting down on a table and mediate over it. So it hasn't gone through the mainstream um, mainstream court, so we don't have that yet. But in terms of uh, a bridge, a smart contract is pretty much similar to a uh, like an ordinary contract. Uh, it's also governed by um, their terms and conditions, and they have to be like. Uh, specific parties agreeing to those terms and conditions. And in case of any breach, uh, the, it can be terminated. Um, and actually, usually, the, it, you, you can have a, all this can be outlined just in case of breach, what happens? What would one, one party do in case of specific performance? What would um, the other party do? But the automation of uh, the, the automation, automated aspect of it, helps a lot when it comes to execution, because usually, um, for example, I'm supposed to make payment to someone instead of uh, instead of holding onto that payment, automatically the payment would uh, be transferred to the other party without me, you know, being um, in so much involved or without the parties as the physical, physical parties being um, so much involved. Um, yeah, so pretty much in case of a, of a breach, then you will have to, what it should be done is that of course you go to a court. But because courts right now are not able to understand you, um, what parties do now, especially businesses I know that, is just sit on the table and agree. And I'm sure now that's the reason why we have Jules coming uh, on board to try and solve these kind of disputes. Because if you take them in mainstream courts, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Even the judges, the magistrates will not know um, what to do. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. It's an interesting point of view. Madeleine, to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, of course, there would be a bit of some echoes um, when, I'm, when I'm speaking. Uh, the reality is, um, there has not been, similarly to Uganda, uh, precedents coming out of our judicial um, uh, uh, judicial players or, or judicial tribunals 
um, with regards to now um, the aspects of online contracts, smart contracts, and uh, the issues of breach. So we are still very much at our infancy when we are speaking about um, technology um, and the ability of our judiciary to 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 handle um, matters which are tech um, related. We have no specific division that to disputes arising with with uh, arising from um, technology such as the smart contracts that we are um, discussing today, uh, yet along the blockchain um, solutions that we, uh, we we might be discussing uh, later on today. Now, in addition to that, of course, we, we cannot say that there are no smart contracts being, being um, made in, in the Tanzanian jurisdiction. Yes, there are. We are a common law based system. And so therefore we borrow leaf a lot from the English law um, and of course the, the, the India um, practice as well. Now uh, with, with our law, actually we do have the law that governs contracts and, and in, in, in any other contract, the smart contract is really in sense um, very similar to the traditional contracts that we're used to that are on paper. Only this time we are on a paperless um, medium. Now, with, with, with the fact that we're on a paperless medium, that, that does not mean that we do not meet the conditions or the elements of making such contract. And so you go back to your contract law and look at the fact that all these elements have to have been fulfilled and to the letter of the law, meaning the contract law that is, that is governing that particular contract, um, uh, be it the Tanzanian law of contract and the, the other um, laws attached to, 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 to that particular transaction. And so if that particular transaction is banned in our country, then that would, uh, would affect the, the validity of the contract. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we have gone a long way over the past five years, though, with our regulatory framework. When we speak of technology, there has been a lot um, that has been taking place on the legal and regulatory um, framework for Tanzania. We have been moving towards pro-innovation and embracing technology and enabling that technology to be able to be acceptable in our marketplace. So we've seen the enactment of the Electronic Transactions Act in 2015, and that act really does provide for the recognition and effect of electronic transactions. Prior to 2015, uh, such provisions were not in place. And so people or businessmen and, um, and especially banking, uh, the banking um, organizations who were already transacting in electronic format um, really didn't have a law to lean on. Whereas with the electronic you're able to say that these particular electronic transactions are um, enforceable in our jurisdiction. Uh, the electronic contracts are covered in the Electronic Transaction Act as well. And so therefore that gives it much more weight and much more water. Um, so I, I would like to say that, of course, without the president, the president coming and the case law building up from the judiciary, dealing with breaches could be difficult um, at this moment. Thank you much, Madeline. I uh, love the insights both from you and uh, Alice, really uh, valuable ones. I think uh, the, you know, the more we go, we move ahead, uh, you know, having this knowledge and sharing it and, you know, getting it uh, more accessible even to other people, it's very crucial because I think uh, the solution, um, you know, has to be taught all together and love that uh, Tanzania, you know, has been uh, shaping up a law dedicated to, you know, electronics uh, kind of transactions. That's uh, impressive because it's something that, you know, the more we move ahead in this global economy, and you know, we are seeing this also with uh, the coronavirus situation, we will be moving you know, a lot of agreements, uh, transactions online more, more and more. So it's very important to 
uh, you know, to have uh, a, a regulatory framework that addresses this kind of, of issues. And um, there is a funny question that actually we got asked uh, in the past uh, webinar. I mean, uh, it's funny from my point of view, of course, because I'm a computer scientist. Um, but there was um, a, pr uh, a lawyer, most probably, <laughs> from the audience that asked, uh, um, like, how's how is an online contract uh, or i mean even even more a smart contract can how can such a contract can be considered valid like how can you know a uh, contractual form for example in the case of the smart contract which is like software based so uh, i'm agreeing for example to send to uh, alessandro i don't know 100 dollars if alessandro ships me uh, a book okay and this relationship it's just coded in a, in a in a smart contract and you know once i receive the good from alessandro alessandro will be able to uh, unlock the funds withdraw the funds from the smart contract and there is no you know supporting paperwork for example that uh, proves that there was a relationship in place etc so i guess that the question from the lawyer was like i mean how can we consider that that code uh you know um an actual contract. Uh, I'll, I'll ask this question to you, Alice. I would love to know your opinion, and maybe I'll revert to Alan Luigi as well. And uh, as Madeline, I think she lost the connection. Uh, when she will be back, I'll address that to that to her as well. Sorry, I think she's back. Um... Um, just, just straightforward. Uh, you know, if you think, how, I mean, how would you go about calling, you know, this kind of contracts like maybe uh, made online or even more with like, a software that helps the two parties? Like it's a software, right? So there is pros that explain and the, you know and conditions of the contractual relationship. It's just there is just coded that. You know, I, I send, I mean, Alessandro sends me the book, the, you know, the, the, the thing and, you know, the, the contract that holds my money, for example, hundred dollars will forward to him, uh, you know, the money. And it's interesting to understand what's uh, your point of view. Like, do you think uh, such a software, it's itself a valuable I and mean, in a valid contract yep. uh, or do we need instead like a supporting document legal document that you know it's maybe signed by me and alessandro and that you know okay and now well there has to be uh, some kind of uh, um, arrangement consent between the two parties that we, you are both agreeing to be um, governed by this contract a contract doesn't can be 100 pages can be half a page, it can be one liner. Um, like Madeline has said, <laughs> the, the fact that this is in electronic form or digital form does not take away the, the, the rules that govern contracts. So if, if we both agree and say, you send me this amount of money within this specific time, and we can electronically um, assent or consent to that, uh, as both of us, that yes, I agree, I'll send you this money with this in this much time, um, then definitely it will be valid immediately. Because we, when you think about it, we have valid contracts that are not, contracts can be oral, can be made orally, can also be uh, in writing. So it doesn't have to be, there's no specific format that is uh, acceptable around the world. Both as long as both parties agree to a certain format, that is already a valid contract. Thanks, Alice, for that. It's an important clarification because, you know, um, we have an audience that has a mix of lawyers and uh, computer scientists, developers, and it's good to clarify these basics. These are things which, you know, you <laughs> for you are like ABC, but it's important to, uh, you know, to, to put the full stop over certain concepts. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Madeleine, do you you also agree with uh, what Alice has said? Uh, uh, I mean, as far as there is an agreement between parties of using a certain tool, it can be a paper contract, a smart contract, or whatever contract. As far as they both agree, uh, that's fair enough. What? Uh, thank you. I, I do agree. 
and and really it is up to now the type of contract and the terms and conditions of those contracts the invalidity now this invalidity i think i have a great example coming from the canadian court supreme court which is a very recent case that a friend of mine shared with me last week um this is a case with uber technologies inc corporation uh, versus hella now this is coming from as i said the supreme court of canada and and what the courts the supreme court held there was that the arbitration clause contained in our Uber standard form service agreement with, um, with, with for example, because Uber has a contract with the drivers and Uber has a contract with the, with also the rider, meaning myself, if I'm going to take Uber. Now that arbitration clause that is in the standard form services agreement with their drivers, which is all in, 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 in all aspects in, in electronic format, was in and unconscionable. and unconscionable. And their reasoning when the courts were making this decision was that the unconscionability of the arbitration clause can be considered separately from that of the contract as a whole. This is very similar conventional way of doing uh, of, of, of business, the traditional contract concept. And so you can see the thinking of the judiciary. The thinking of the judiciary is very pro how it was before. So we're not, we're not changing the concepts, the principles around um, contractual um, arrangements, around um, drafting and, and, and having, having had clicked if it's a click-based uh, contract, or having had had that brown sort of, you know, you just see that page pop up. But if those terms and conditions have not considered that weight, the balance, then the, the unconscionability would be questioned, and the invalidity could could arise from those terms and conditions. The were either not in agreement or um, were not made aware of the terms uh, prior. Now, you know, we all understand that when we're when we're going through our our usual business, and and, and especially when you're purchasing online, you you tend not to to read the terms and conditions. You seem to I I have that habit as well when I'm subscribing to a lot of uh, platforms I'm subscribing and clicking yes terms and conditions I agree. Now, I I have to be uh, very very uh, sincere I have not read these terms and conditions I have the Uber app with me so when things go wrong I, I definitely will be one of those who, who didn't have knowledge of what I was signing up to so the 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 agreement that is self-contained um it's a self-contained contract uh to 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 that contract um it has to be very well drafted in 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 sense that it adheres to the law of the country the elements that are to form that electronic contract so if i take you back to our electronic transactions act now there we have a section that provides for the validity of transactions in electronic form. And it says that it has to satisfy certain elements and, 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 and certain elements are outlined in the Tra Electronic Transaction Act of Tanzania. Now, when you speak of um, the contract, you're also speaking of the execution of that contract. So the validity of the electronic signature is put to question as well. How do you, you know, we, we're used to printing and signing and then scanning it through. This is how we do business here in Tanzania. However, electronic signatures are more than that. And I will let the technologists um, tell you about how that is affected. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, we are like halfway to the webinar, but so much uh, knowledge. And uh, I mean, I, I find this really, really valuable myself. So I'm pretty sure the audience also 
uh, will be engaged and I definitely ask uh, anyone who has questions to drop them in the question tab. And uh, for now, we are just addressing the ones from the first webinar, but for sure we'll make space also to the new questions. Uh, but since this topic, it's very, very interesting from my perspective. I would like also to know the opinion of uh, Alessandro and Luigi, starting from Luigi, um, you know, especially on the points touched by Madeleine and Alice, because, uh, for example, you have been working a lot with uh, privacy uh, laws in uh, Europe and GDPR. Uh, so what's your take uh, on, you know, those kind of, <laughs> of contracts in which most of the cases I mean, I can honestly say myself included and 99% of the people that I know, we just, you know, yeah, agree, checkbox, tick here, tick there. But then, you know, you, you really don't weigh uh, the, 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 the contractual relationship which you are getting into, especially with digital, uh, you know, with the websites and mobile apps. Like you just always give your consent to whatever just because you need to use the service, for example, right? What's your take on that, Luigi? I think your mic is on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's an interesting question to me, not only because I'm a European lawyer, lawyer, but also because I'm an Italian lawyer and the Italian, Italian law is even more, you know, mm, more demanding for a couple of things. So, uh, I'll try to make it simple. Mm, can you hear me? Okay, great. So um, usually there are contracts, okay, in, in Europe, but I guess that it's the same all over the world that um, have the written form requirement. So if you cannot meet the requirement, the contract, you know, or is not valid or is valid but it becomes tough to prove it before a court so that's one point and in this regard the first question is in my view can a contract concluded by means of uh, electronic technologies be considered equal to a traditional written form because at the end of the day we are still writing information okay we are still writing something, okay? Not maybe in a traditional language, but there are informations that are connected to an electronic form, okay? I believe, and this is the solution that to a certain extent has been adopted by the Italian legislator, that an online contract, and specifically a smart contract, is valid as far uh, as it meets contract requirements so willing of the parties to transact uh causa in italian in italian law consideration in common uh, law systems and scope of the contract as far as these elements can be correctly identified okay i believe that the contra contractual relationship exists is valid and it's also written in a different way, but it's written. It's not hollow. That's my view. Okay. It's written, but in a different form. Now, as regard uh, B2B transactions, things are more simple because there is no this kind of a balancement, okay, in terms of bargaining power between the parties. But when we come uh, to... Mm, business to consumer transaction things become more tricky one because data uh, uh citizens data are involved and this is very problematic in europe because the gdpr applies i mean the gdpr also applies at south outside of the european union where uh, a company is processing data of people that resides that are in the European continent, uh, in the European Union, in the territory of the European Union. So it's even something that goes beyond the territory of the European Union. And also certain jurisdictions require more strict requirements for approving 
uh, certain clause. That's why I was joking about Italy. For instance, in Italy, certain clauses that, um, for instance, the forum choice, okay, it's a clause that needs to be approved specifically by ticking uh, a dedicated checkbox, okay? This kind of clauses that can uh, result in some kind of a unbalancement for contractual relationships need to be picked in different checks, checkbox in Europe. And that for sure applies uh, in Italy. And as when we come to privacy, it applies all over the Europe. So this is very problematic. Well, not really, as far as you know what you're dealing with. My idea is that, and this is to conclude, that meeting contract requirements is the first uh, point, okay? So as far as you can build an electronic application that can track willing of the parties, scope, consideration, you can prove that you have a valid contractual relationship. Second point, once you do that, you need to provide for a consistent uh, user experience, let's say legal user experience that complies with the law of the country where you're aiming, I mean, when you're planning to provide goods, services, and so on and so forth. So if my platform for selling goods is targeting a European audience, Okay, I must be sure that the user experience is tailored on that audience, that the checkboxes are in the right place, and so on and so forth. Of sense. Thank you so much, Luigi. And uh, I would like to pose a question to, to Ale, actually, because I know that you love uh, this topic uh, of, you know, what, what actually makes a contract, right? Like, uh, it can be, again, there are different forms of contracts, as we have discussed so far. But, you know, like the actual meaning of being in a contractual relationship with someone else. And, uh, for example, a comment from your side, Ale, on the COVID situation. There are uh, quite few governments, for example, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, created um, COVID track tracking apps to, to, you know, like track the, the, the spread of the disease. And, you know, they were handling uh, citizens uh, data, for example. I mean, several jurisdictions, Singapore, even india in which i am right now uh you know this caused like a major uh how can i say um problem right because it's the it's the the i mean the common good balanced with you know the interest of the personal individual and uh you know getting into something like that most people just installed the app without re actually realizing you know the kind of data that they were exposing about themselves what's your take on that and do you see also sorry uh, do you also see a future for this kind of, uh, you know, exchange of data data to happen on something like blockchain or to a smart contract? Do you do you foresee this happening in the future? <clears throat> okay, thanks, Lucas. So, uh, first of all, on, on the main topic, uh, I mean, I, I think that uh, there is a, um, I mean, a, a crucial point to to discuss. There are two main chances. I mean, that the, the world will evolve. I mean, how how the world will, will evolve. The first one is to imagine that, uh, I mean, everyone will be able to create their own smart contracts. So I can wake up in the morning, I can access to a kind of editor, I create a smart contract for my, my specific need in the company, with or without, I mean, the, uh, the help of a lawyer, or maybe the lawyer set up the smart contract, uh, I mean, one step uh, before. So in, in this case, I mean, um, in this version of the future, uh, eventually, the smart contracts can be, and therefore, the problem of legal validity can be can arise in a, in a specific way because you can draft the smart contract, close a relationship, a bit economically relevant relationship, and in this case, we could face one technology of problems. Then there is a second, let's say, uh, hypothesis of how the world could evolve in the next ten years, which is where, I mean, smart contracts will be used, but under the specific interface. And the interface it will be just a platform with centralized elements. So we will find again the TNC, again the terms and conditions that nobody read. So I think that these two options should be always to consider. I, I personally think that they will coexist, coexist, and probably the second one will prevail because people, I mean, what the 
probably the soft the history of software and, and startups showed us in the last 20 years is that uh, i mean the winner is the always the easiest solution so i i can imagine that if there will be platforms with a big bold terms and condition and then it, it will be i mean those platforms will enable uh, economically relevant relationships eventually executed by smart contract on smart contract technology um, about the, 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 the issue you're mentioning about uh, I mean, data governance uh, regarding apps uh, for COVID management issued or adopted by all public authorities and the chance that those data would be managed by blockchain technology, this is a, a really tough question because um, as, as we always know, uh, I mean, privacy and blockchain are not real enemies. They can, they can seem sometimes enemies. But it depends on what you are going to put on the blockchain. So normally there is the ashification process, which means that you won't find on the public register the specific data, but you will find just you know the crypto cryptographic version or abstraction of the that specific data. So in general terms, it could be possible. I don't really know. Um, I mean, uh, how this could help. If I'm, I mean, unless we want to think some kind of scenarios where we want to be sure that uh, every uh, single person, I don't know, uh, accepted the, 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 I mean, um, we, we might will to timestamp the exact moment and in time where, where, where a subject, in, I mean, put, put inside the app a specific data or um, other ideas like this. But uh, I mean, as long as this is a, priority of a government and we trust the, the central authority in, in, how can I say, in sharing the right data, I don't think there is a real huge need of that. Of course, look at um, everyone here, um, there might be scenarios where, you know, uh, politics and maybe interest of certain specific maybe governments could bring eventually, you know, uh, the management of data to be how can I say, not completely clear and transparent, right? So eventually you can have an interest in saying, look, the, the, the COVID cases are 100 when maybe the, on the apps there are millions or thousands or whatever. So in that specific case, eventually, where also the process of inputting data on the blockchain is uh, secure, so the Oracle, let's say, chain, let's call it in this way, so the, the, the Oracle, um, structure is, is safe and secure, eventually there could be for sure a, a need. Uh, but in that case, so that's why it's a really complex topic I was saying, and uh, thanks for this question, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's, it's um, it, I mean, it, it, really, it really depends on, I mean, <laughs> how can we, uh, I mean, which is the, the major interest, so for sure a government that wants to act with transparency could consider this kind of hypothesis, and for sure in that case, just to come back on the original question, uh, we will have a platform, in this case an app, iOS, Android or whatever, which is an interface eventually with components which are centralized, and smart contracts, smart contract elements there will be a TNC, right? So honestly, when everyone is really interested in, I mean, in the topic of legal validity of smart contracts, I understand the interest from a theoretical perspective. It is for sure really interesting in many cases, but like in this example that we just, you know, for, for exercising ourselves, for discussing uh, I mean, about that interest topic, there are plenty of cases where maybe blockchain technology can be used, but I mean, within a specific platform or app which will have a normal tnc normal constraint i mean constraints eventually unless you want to totally go move to adapt so this is i think the the major difference also we, we should consider thanks Ali, for that and of course i will be asking you tough questions uh, because so that you can prove your knowledge about our contracts and uh, and blockchain um yeah totally makes sense and you know here in india for example there was a bit of uh you know uh, chaos because uh, the 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 um, who developed the app wasn't actually directly the government but it was a private company that developed the app so that's where you know it 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 created a lot of problems because you know 
where is this data stored and you know who's managing it and why this company and not another company and so on and so forth right so these were the kind of uh, uh, questions that uh, you know are, are arose at that moment and you know were addressed in somehow by by the government had to be addressed at least anyway as you talked about uh, the future ale uh, i think um, there is a recurring question that we get uh, many times and i would like to share this actually with all of you starting from alice and madeleine uh, which is basically related to the odr be because we know that uh, odrs can provide a value uh, in you know making uh, dispute management uh, time efficient cost efficient uh, reducing a lot of overheads and today the world is in this uh, in this uh, is living a pandemic so you know uh, it makes a uh, lot of sense to pursue and resolve disputes online, definitely. But a question that we fre frequently actually receive in uh, from the webinars that we've done in the past, especially from uh, developing uh, I mean, people coming from uh, developing countries, uh, they're always concerned about, you know, the access to technology, the access to internet, the, you know, okay, there is a tool which is more efficient, cost efficient, so it can improve the access to justice, wonderful, we all want, we all want that, but how do we solve the problem of being able to access that technology in, you know, uh, for everyone, for whoever it's, you know, part of the, the system, right? So I would like to ask this question of, how do you see the adoption of ODRs in developing countries if you think there is a friction or barrier and what's the solution for that? I think it's a very important question. Uh, we'll start with you, Alice. Um, the, in many platforms, something people always uh, use as a pushback that, uh, Alice, why are you promoting this, um, these technologies when uh, it, it's in developing countries, especially in a country where I come from, Uganda, uh, people are still looking for basic, you know, basic, they still have rather basic needs, uh, very, very, very basic needs. So, you know, accessing these technologies is pretty much um, like, a, <laughs> like a fairy tale. But what I tell people is one, um, when, like, I'll give an example, mobile money. When mobile money had just come onto uh, the market, that was the first thing everyone kept on saying that, how can you bring about uh, a platform or a technology that uh, the very poor people cannot be able to access? If you're talking about financial inclusion, as I speak right now, in most parts of Africa, uh, from the remotest part of Africa, everyone has a phone which is able to send and receive mobile money. Seven years ago, this was like how you, the first thing they will tell you, you uh, the people who had uh, initiated this project, how can you talk about financial inclusion? That means you're leaving behind the majority, again, the majority of uh, Africans on the continent. So what am I trying to say? I, For me, my experience, what I've realized is that when there's a, very, very big need for something, or when some, uh, for example, this technology, when it has, it has, it is solving a very, very big problem, you'll find that uh, everyone finds a way of actually getting onto the platform. Even governments end up, you know, subsidizing certain, um, uh, if, if it means taxes or some taxes, or bringing these platforms to the extremely needy people. To me, I don't even look at it as um, something. To worry about because uh right now again we are using a lot of uh, technology in access to justice and it's still about you know you have to use your phone to, to like to reach a lawyer it will be much cheaper for you instead of traveling 100 kilometers to come to the city to meet your lawyer so you you use uh, your phone to reach out to your lawyer as opposed to saying, you know what, this technology doesn't solve anything, we solve it for 100, 100 kilometers. So you would rather, so you would rather access the technology, access the technology whatever it is, you have to do so that it cuts down all the costs you'll be incurring. I think it will definitely work itself out. Right now, first of all, even the, the, there's a very, very big increment of the use of uh, internet on the continent. Um, again, you will ask, how, how has that happened? on a continent where everyone thinks that majority of the people won't be able to access um, 
uh, phones or internet, I'm not worried at all. The fact that this technology is solving so many of the problems we have on the continent right now. Um, in fact, I was talking to someone earlier and post COVID, rather, yeah, before COVID, we had a backlog of cases. We, our systems were clogged. Like, you can't have, a, you can't have, you can't get an, a date in uh, a hearing date um, for until maybe sorry, within a year. If you can't get a hearing date within a year, you tell me if that is justice. That that can't be justice, right? So if you have a platform that can actually can assure you uh, quick access to justice, I'll do anything. I'll do anything, all the grandparents, all the, the, the extremely, extremely poor, they'll find a way of getting onto um, these kind of platforms. So I'm not worried at all. Thanks for that, Alice. I love the, the positivity I and I totally easy. share the, you know, I totally share the, the message. Well, it's, a wonder, it's an important and strong message. And I, I mean, also at Jor, of course, uh, we are a bit biased because we, you know, we work in that direction, uh, but we strongly believe that that's the way to go. It's, uh, you know, it, it's better to have a way rather than not having none, right? So it makes totally sense to me. Now, Madeleine, to you, because, I mean, you are the founder of uh, iResolve, so of course uh, you are, uh, you know, touched by this topic at least. So would love to know the, the opinion of an existing ODR platform that actually solves disputes online in Tanzania. Let us know your view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and and I I concur with uh, Alice in 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 in, its, in her um, address um, entirely um, uh, because uh, we we do have to realize um, and and maybe I could share just my my here um, the re the reality we have to to come to terms with the reality that the um, connectivity gap that we're talking about, or the, um, the access to the internet has tremendously, immensely decreased over the years, especially when we speak to African countries, and more so zooming in East Africa. If you look at our mobile transactions, you would be amazed what is happening, the activity that is coming from, uh, from, um, from our, from our, um, oh, oopsie, sorry, I just wanted to, to, to do the different slide there. Um, uh, so this is the slide that I want to, uh, to share with you. Um, and if you, if you can see there, the internet penetration in Africa, 2020 Q1, via V the rest of the world and the average, we are 39.3%. Now that speaks volumes. That speaks volumes being that the estimated internet users in Africa alone as of 31st of March, 2020, that is Q1 2020, where 526, or oh, let me round that up, 527 million users. Now, in, in itself, very, very much so pleasing um, to say, very pleasing. Um, so technology is no longer just about nice to have it's it's a must this is the fourth party the fourth party in in our um i, I would like to disable it's the fourth party in our in our in our in our engagement um and and when i speak of the fourth party with respect to i resolve I resolve being the technology, um, and 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 in this respect also the virtual um, realities of of having uh, conducting your um, 
your dispute resolution mechanism in an online portal um, speaks volumes. Um, and, and, and it's not that the continent is not ready for this technology because we've seen by the wake of the, uh, the, the pandemic that a lot that had been challenges prior to 2020 had sort of broken down in the sense that acceptance, of course, the cultural um, challenge was, uh, it, it, it met up with us. And so we had to accept these um, technologies. And so you find that virtual courts, similarly to Uganda, were now in full operation, despite the fact that our judiciary had already introduced these electronic filing um, provisions, had already had some sort of a technology in place um, prior to 2020, but it was non-existence in acting um, in our practice day-to-day -day practice because we never saw the need and, 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 and we never say to ourselves this option is a viable option and it is, it is achievable, you see? So now we, we have that confidence. We have the confidence in technology. And I say this in, 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 in very positive light that we, we're no longer fearing technology. And if lawyers... And, and now I'm speaking as a lawyer um, and representing my clients, I would want to encourage my clients and, and break those barriers uh, one by one in the sense that, you know, you give them the confidence that the system is secure, the system is transparent, the system is going to take accountability at the end. So client distribution really, um, we're, we're going to be seeing a very big spike in the near future. And with virtual court systems as what Jor has been working on is, is, even, is even better because of the fact that now we would have a pool of, 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 of different, um, uh, different um, systems all aligned into one where parties can access justice. Parties are able to access justice where they are. Now, so I speak to the fact that the connectivity gap or the issue of internet is really just dying out. It's narrowed down to, to, its, to nearly now to its last sense. Um, of course, then you can speak of populations that we have in, 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 different, um, in different jurisdictions or different in the, uh, the developing and developed countries. Um, and we're seeing that um, that that um, that dynamic also playing a major fact in now uh, having been able to access technology um, in in that respect. But internet-wise, I think this is a topic that we, we would be seeing um, as having been resolved uh, to the extent that it has been in the sense that connectivity is very much available. Um, here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. I uh, love the insights, of course, from a practical experience since you have been doing ODR uh, for quite a few years. So definitely <laughs> your point of view, it's, it's very important. And I would uh, like to actually um, listen to the opinion also of uh, uh, Alessandro and Luigi uh, on this topic, because uh, since, you know, uh, we are working on the on the ODR side as well, uh, with George trying to, you know, uh, doing s s some work, some part, some of our work in that field. Uh, I think we can skip maybe the connectivity part because that's, I think, Alice and Madeline answered perfectly that aspect. But I would like to know uh, what are your feelings, especially you, Alessandro, on, you know, how these kind of tools, especially, uh, you know, after this uh, unfortunate pandemic, how these tools can help people and parties and companies and individuals to settle their disputes in a more efficient way? Sure. Well, first of all, I would like to say that it's, it's really incredible every time we do these kind of speeches to, you know, to, to, to chat with people, lawyers, and then, uh, I mean, um, uh, friends uh, in general from, from different continents or countries and I mean to find ourselves so aligned on the same concept so uh, 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 we know Alice since a while now it's, it's, it's a 
one of the first time we we chat in, in this way with Madeline and really positively uh, how can I say uh, surprised because it's it's I mean we are finding the same pattern the same mindset the same um, vision about the future and this is really amazing uh, let me tell you uh, a really fun short and fun story there is a friend of mine who is a lawyer the typical how can I say the typical um, solo lawyer uh, uh, around 42, 43 years old uh, from, uh, I mean, he comes from Sardinia, but he's practicing in Rome, Italy. And uh, in, in Rome, there are around 26,000 of lawyers, so it's, it's, it's a lawyer city, let's say. And uh, he was one guy, one guy really, not really against technology, but let's say that he's the kind of person more, how can I say, enjoying a bit of tradition. So amazing suet, a nice coffee or a nice tea, blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's say in, the, in, your, in your mind is that image, okay? And of course, maybe a, a nice suet with also, not really the papillon, but also a good pipe, like Sherlock Holmes. So, I mean, a, a fashionable person, but not the typical nerd or geek or geeky. And uh, he is a super open-minded person, but before the COVID, he was really not looking at the hypothesis of solving online disputes. It's not really for, I mean, uh, skepticism about online, because from a logical perspective, he could have even before understood the importance of digital procedures. But maybe it's, it's like, I don't know, uh, before using the first uh, iPod and listening music on an MP, MP3, did you consider to, I mean, to listen music on, on the same, you know, device and not to use your Walkman with the different CDs and whatever. So to make a really long story short, after the, the COVID, actually, he, he replaced his, his, uh, his law firm in his apartment and he was uh, enjoying his, his, his pipe. So even in that scenario, there was a really, how can I say, a good atmosphere, of course, for, for deep, you know, uh, thought. And he was sharing with me the idea that, look, uh, you know what? I realized that these, <laughs> sorry, these court hearings online, I think we should keep them even in the future. And I, of course, didn't pitch him anything we are doing at joke. So this story tells me that, uh, uh, I mean, he can be representing the example probably of, of, the, of the average, but I, I say that in a really positive way. So if there is no wrong or uh, right. There is no beautiful and bad. It's just a thing, you know, before the COVID, I, don't, I think major, I mean, the, the, the most of the lawyers, the law firms didn't consider this, this instrument, not because they are, I can say, close to innovation, but I mean, for, I don't know, maybe cultural elements or, or you have to see the opportunity and touch with your hands before, I mean, the education process brings a technology to disrupt a specific industry. So the COVID, this acceleration is absolutely, it can't be, you know, reversed at this point. So. To, to, to answer, Luca, of course, we are doing the, the, the first, let's say, multi-jurisdiction of the art, blockchain-based, decentralized, and whatever. So I, I can't tell you I am against it. it it's it's, 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 a, it's a by, by definition. So uh, what, what I can just add is, in my opinion, uh, Madeleine was really right in, in, in remarking one point, which is uh, she, was taking, she was taking the angle uh, according to which uh, online is even more secure, and it is. This is true. Let me also, you know, uh, avoid. I mean, to, to our audience, to, to clarify a point, someone could think, "Oh, but technology maybe it's unsecure." And what about paper? You know, the papers regarding, in terms of the fascicolo, the paper uh, archive regarding a specific, you know, case that are stored in, in, in the course. You, you can go, go in many courts of Italy, for example, but I'm sure in Brazil. It's the same or in many countries, you can open the door if you're a lawyer with a simple, you know, plastic card saying that you are a lawyer, you can get inside and, I don't know, you can take one. It's full of stories about, oh, we, we, we lost a, a, a paper archive. So if it happens in a digital world, at least there is a trace. So I don't, I can't say that it's always more secure, but at least it's traced. So you can find eventually the, the responsible. In our case, but we will have time for discussing that, as platform, we don't have on our server access to clear data. So they are encrypted, which means that if there is an hacker or whatever happens, he will find data that are not available, uh, they can, can be really accessed. 
So if you think about online, this, it's, it's not like, oh, we are going to do something really, I mean, exoteric and new, blah, blah, blah. No, it's, it's even more, it should be even more secure and for, for sure it can be tracked more. Uh, there is just one final point that I, I'm just introducing to you, but, but this will be the, I mean, I think we will have months for discussing this in, 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 in really deeper. Um, in my opinion, you know, we have a huge opportunity. Uh, the data that Madeleine was showing, it, it says that around, I think, 59% of the human beings today have access to internet. I know that there is another data which says that 46% of people have real access to justice. So it seems really clear to me, and also because the estimations, I think that in the next 10 years, the percentage of the population in the world that will have access to internet will increase dramatically. I mean, it's really clear to me that this is one way for, for, for ensuring process and more access to justice. Maybe new models, and in my opinion, decentralized technologies will take a major, will, sorry, will have a major role in the next 10 years. If you think it's just 2030, it's not going to be, I don't know, 10 years ago. If you remember, the iPhone was introduced in 2007, which is 13 years ago, one three. And in 13 years, we changed completely our behaviors. I mean, do you remember when there was no uh, uh, iPhone, there was the, the big Nokia navigator, or there was 8HTC, a completely different world. So in 10 years from now, there will be another completely different world. And I think that ODR online and decentralization, in my opinion, will really increase access to justice. But on this final topic, I mean, I would probably speak, we, we can speak next time more deeply. I hope you enjoyed my, my answer and uh, brainstorming. Thank you so much, Ale. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, you want to say something, Madeleine? Just so that I can, I can, I can chip on on, on Alexander's great point. He he spoke of um, the 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 statistics um, and 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 referred to the forty six percent. Now, if you come back to um, where I'm situated on the continent here. Yes, we spoke of the graph saying that it was about 527 million. Now, if you think of those 527 million, take 70% being the youth who are under, uh, you know, when you say youth, this is under uh, 35, maybe under 40. Now, we, we all know that um, the L the older generation, unfortunately, um, you know, have have been very um, taking uh, their time in, in getting on with technology. But the youth, we believe, and I feel that I, 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 I am of, of this strong believer that the youth are very tech absorbing, tech absorbing. They absorb the tech. And, and, and that's why we, we see a lot of technological um, uh, you know, startups um, having having a, a, a quite a good time because the youth do absorb and take on the technology and they are tech savvy. And so the idea of having a virtual court, having an online uh, solution for any, anything, be it resolving disputes, be it, conducting business such as, um, you know, we've seen the Ubers and the likes will really just be an acceptable standard to that market base. And so I, I feel that um, there's a very strong um, and, and um, great um, light at the end of the tunnel for, for, the, for um, those who are looking into the practice of uh, virtual um, being a virtual lawyer, being a virtual um, practitioner with respect to being a neutral or providing for such access to justice, um, legal aid uh, provisions using virtual um, technologies and mediums. That's a wonderful point that you've touched, Madeline. I think uh, mm, definitely, you know, uh, you this kind of solution of course they cater more towards the youth of these countries and i mean 
of course, their demand for connectivity, efficiency, you know, uh, processes being faster, not slow. It's really what we are trying to address here. And of course, that's part also of Jure's vision. And that said, of, of course, you know, if even someone from older generation is keen into adopting and you know, changing a bit of how we generally does things, of course, is more than welcome, right? That's the beauty of technology, it does not discriminate uh, anyone. So you, you can access these instruments and that's uh, you know, beautiful and that's part of our vision. Um, on this topic, uh, uh, I'm seeing that we went uh, quite ahead uh, the timings that we shared with, the, with our community, uh, but that's perfectly fine because I'm seeing still the engagement <laughs> high. Um, Luigi, um, let's do one thing because uh, we, it's true that we, we have almost finished all the questions from the first webinar, but I would like also to address one question, a couple of questions from the, the audience of today, uh, which I think it's fair enough. I, I see that most of them involve uh, smart contracts, uh, but given that we have talked a lot about uh, uh, ODR, uh, why don't you address the question from Shola Adekunle? I hope that I pronounced it right. Uh, which is like, what are the challenge phase, phase that blockchain arbitration, blockchain-based arbitration could face? Because that's something that, a subject that you have explored a lot, maybe you can give your insights on that. Okay, so the first point, I believe, is designing a platform that is flexible. I mean, since we are talking about blockchain, I assume that we are talking about online arbitration. And regardless of the technology technology adopted, you need to make your platform flexible, which means that if I'm planning to start an online arbitration chamber, let's say in Uganda, or I'm planning to start a new chamber in France, I need to build up a platform that allows those chambers to build up arbitral proceedings that make sense both from you know a, a domestic law standpoint and also in terms of adoptance, like issuing a procedure, designing a procedure that can be appreciated by private parties. So that's the first challenge. And the other challenge is reimagining a lot of, um, let's say, uh, phases of the procedure in an online way that makes sense, that is valid, that uh, allows um, to track, okay, uh, consents and uh, other kind of, um, other kind of ways for manif for uh, mm -hmm. showing your intentions, okay, to all the players engaged in arbitration. So, for instance, how can we uh, notify communications? How can we notify uh, statements of claims and defense? Um, how can the parties or other players, uh, also from the arbitration chamber, sign acts, documents? Uh, all this kind of challenge. How ah, should be the arbitral award signed? Okay, because at the end of the day, you're doing all of this to get your arbitral award. So also the way the arbitral award, I, I believe that the way the arbitral award is framed and structured and issued, it's maybe the most important thing. But everything must be correct because otherwise you can, let's say, invoke violations of due process principles or other kind of violations during the procedure. And at the point, the arbitral awards became pointless. So paying a lot of attention while designing the platform is the first challenge. And it it's a challenge that includes many challenges. Thanks for that, Luigi. I don't know if uh, Madeleine, uh, maybe you want to chime in on uh, on this aspect of. Um, I mean, as far as you have, I mean, of course you are, you know perfectly arbitration and uh, online arbitration, but do you see any chat? Maybe on the online arbitration part, let's leave it only on on, uh, on online and let's not add the blockchain, you know, touch in it. Uh, 
do you think, I mean, what do you think are the main challenges for such a procedure uh, from your point of view, compared to, of course, a normal, you know, when you actually physically go to the arbitration chamber and do it? Thank you, Luca. Thank you so much for that question. Um, well, with, with, with online arbitration and, and what has been um, the experience so far, you see, uh, online arbitration has been has been been done over the years. You know, when you find that a witness cannot get to a particular locale, they would have some sort of a virtual arrangement for them. Expert witness could provide their um, expert witness evidence from 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 any any location. Now, but the the difficulties around that is that we we did not have. Uh, proper protocols and guidelines that were assisting um, the parties, the councils, the administrative institution, if there is any involved, um, and and of course um, the the other stakeholders who play a part in an online uh, in, an, in an arbitration proceeding. Um, on the online media, it was a challenge due due to 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 the these factors. Now, we understand that this is an adversarial process where you find your advocates having to, to conduct the hearing similarly in the way that we see in the courts of law. And so that, that posed a challenge. How then would a lawyer's advocacy skills be um, affected by the use of technology? Uh, the other challenge was, uh, that, that was seen was the arbitral tribunal themselves um, in, in, in certain aspects. Some arbitrations have, have involved um, tremendously sensitive um, issues. And if that arbitration has a factor that, that the arbitral tribunal uh, felt that uh, they needed um, the physical presence of the parties, then that could also, um, uh, you know, result to that being having been conducted um, on an offline setting as opposed to a virtual setting. So there were many challenges that one would have encountered for them to then agree to, to, to go to the virtual um, arbitration. But what we experienced over the years is that we, we would be um, getting consent to have the arbitration, um, the exchange of documents part, the, the, you know, the first part, being fully automated and and fully online however when it got to the to the hearing stage you would find that most arbitral tribunals of course considering the factors that i have said the sensitivity of the case the um the actual um, nature of the case and, and and the parties involved uh their capabilities to handle technology you know some some lawyers i have a pending arbitration where some lawyers can't even you know get into my zoom uh i have had to put them on whatsapp so that i could conduct the meeting because zoom proved a challenge so <laughs> and, and so it's a lot of factors that one would consider so what we we experienced as i was saying was that we would go then back to offline. So we were doing a partial automated arbitration. And this is, this is the, the most common um, one that we, we have done. A fully um, conducted arbitration online um, has never been experienced by iResolve. That is a confession because of the fact that we needed to go offline for that hearing to take place. However, 2020 has been quite a good year where we've seen, um, we, as I had said before, more accepting uh, of, of this um, reality of, 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 of technology um, and embracing the fourth party, which is, which is that exactly. And so we've seen also certain organizations and institutions uh, provide for us guidelines. You know, the African Arbitration Academy uh, and, and I was happy to play a part in the drafting committee, uh, went on to draft and, 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 um, and launch uh, the virtual hearings uh, protocol in April. We've seen um, very authoritative institutions, arbitral institutions as well, um, come up with a more robust um, 
guidelines and, and protocols to assist parties in conducting arbitral hearings using um, technology. And so I, I would feel that these, these challenges as to the technology, the use, the acceptance, the cultural um, uh, you know, uh, pushback have really been there. Uh, we would see that um, in future, I would feel that, of course, certain uh, cases would have to be um, go to go physical, but in, re in most of the, of the cases can be done online, and and that would be the 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 way forward really in certain arbitrations, especially when you talk about this the small claim arbitrations, um, which uh, yes, which um, could um, be done and conducted in order to save the costs the the time and the expenses that um, are involved in, in, in getting parties to the locale um, for a face-to-face. -face. Um, so I think that's what I can add on, 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 to the, on with, with respect to challenges that um, have been faced by online arbitration. Thank you so much, Madeline. Um, again, uh, you know, insights coming from your direct experience are really, you know, helpful. I would like to listen to you, Alice, as well. What's your thought on that? Well, I would just say the question is, what are the challenges facing a blocking arbitration? Um, I would, there's nothing. Right now, we don't have it, but I know for certain what would be, um, what, what are the challenges around uh, introducing this kind of uh, a platform? One is uh, when you look at the word even blockchain, everyone, there's been a misconception when you talk about blockchain. The first thing everyone thinks of, you talk about cryptocurrencies. So, the, and then cryptocurrencies have their own stigma, and people just afraid. Like, what exactly is this? Are we going? In a, is it a trading platform? So, that the, there has been because of just a misconception of what is blockchain, people are a kind of held back. But um, what we are seeing right now, of course, post COVID and during COVID. People are willing to to understand, to appreciate what uh, these technologies are about. Um, so I think for me, in the past or post COVID, that was the, the biggest challenge: the misconception on the technology. Because most people, every time you talk about blockchain, straight away you you want to trade um, uh, cryptocurrencies. Then the other one I think would be cyber attacks. People are Madeline talked about people thinking um, how com how secure these platforms are, and if you're talking about confidentiality, arbitration has the issue of confidentiality is extremely key when it comes to uh, arbitration. So, if you don't, if you if parties don't feel confident that uh, their the, the proceedings, uh, um, the the hearings, are uh, the platforms they're using for these proceedings are secure, it, it, it might definitely cause a, a very big challenge. The only good thing with blockchain as a, as a, as a platform, as a technology, this is some of the things that definitely, definitely uh, it deals with. Uh, rather uh, much more um, better security than any or secure platform, much more security than any online uh, platform we've had um, in the world. So I think if, if I mean, minus those two things, I mean, the, the whole misconception of what the technology is and cyber security, cyber issues, the risk should be okay, really. And maybe uh, the challenge would be people navigating the platform, because if, uh, if you have uh, many lawyers, like I think, Alessandro talked about the average lawyer who actually handles arbitration matters is above between the age of what? Maybe 35 and above. Those are really the ones who are very active. And at the same time, those are the lawyers who are not very, who are not, who are not willing, especially post COVID, to appreciate uh, the, these different technologies. So that would be actually a, a very key issue. If I don't understand the technology you're using, why do I have to use the platform? But again, post COVID, I know many people now are listening and they're willing to try out this. But uh, I'm sure right now what Jury is doing, um, coming up with these trainings and creating more awareness, um, we are definitely, uh, it, 
we are on the right track. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, totally agreed with you. And uh, misconception of this. Uh words and the technology itself it's yeah what drives you know so many people away and initiatives like this brings bring awareness and more clarity and that's why we like you know to go through the questions that's why we thought this format of taking the questions directly from the audience so that we i mean we are the expert we are considered the expert it's our job and our duty to you know inform and uh, you know make this knowledge more widespread of course because the end goal of it's for these solutions for ODR in general to be more mainstream and being used uh, worldwide. That's what uh, we believe in. Um, on this note, I see that we have touched our time limit uh, for today. Um, I will uh, ask Alessandro kindly to um, to come on stage. I mean, to unmute himself so that you can share maybe a big news with the, with the community of this webinar. Sure. So. Sure. First of all, thank you so much, Madeleine. Alice, it's been great to, to, to be here today answering to this Q&A. I think in the future we will be doing really several of, of these initiatives when we will announce some cooperations together, but this is not the day for doing so. So um, today, generally, uh, more generally speaking, I'm inviting you. Uh, I mean, you are you guys that are still with us after one hour and a half. Uh, if you are interested, you can uh, join. Uh, there will be a link in the chat, as I think now, and uh, you can um, whitelist, so you can book your, uh, let's say, um, place over uh, in the list for accessing to our platform, which will be released on, in the next uh, month. And uh, we will go. I mean, um, giving the, I mean, priority to the first, you know, um, whitelisted. And uh, they just published now the, the, the link. So uh, if you are interested in uh, ODR, if you're interested in blockchain-based decentralized ODR, and you want to know more about what we are doing, please list there. You will receive a lot of really news, really interesting news in the next weeks. We have a lot of, uh, I mean, um, news, concepts, and also we would really like to, to hear your feedback. And uh, our community, I think it's, it's spread over really many countries which we look at should should do a calculation because i think it's more than 20 at this at this point and we wanted since we really loved the the vibe uh that we found in the last time in in the continent of africa by from tanzania nigeria botswana uganda we wanted to to i mean uh, the first this is the first time i i think we we published this link uh, which and also this name of injustice so I invite you, if you're interested, to whitelist it. So of course, it's totally for free. And you will be, I mean, updated really, really often about the, our, ne our next progresses. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today. And uh, I mean, I saw really a lot of questions also today. And uh, this is up to us. We really appreciate that. And uh, so thanks also for being with us today. If you have any questions or uh, ideas, write to us at info at juror.io. And thanks, Luca, for hosting in such a great moment for creating the. Um, you see, you're not only becoming a lawyer after after all these experience in the field, but also a great host. So, <laughs> thanks, thank you so much, Ale. Uh, I'm thanking personally Alice um, from Lex Africa, Madeleine from Iresol, uh, for you know spending some time with us uh, this afternoon with us. It was really a wonderful session. Thank you so much for your insights. It's a pleasure to you know talk and listen to experts like you, and uh, we really love to do these sessions. Uh, uh, for the audience, uh, the, uh, I know there are some questions that we didn't address. Don't worry, we'll take them uh, offline. Most probably, we'll be posting them to our uh, socials, so you can just uh, follow up there with the, with the answers. Uh, thanks, of course, Luigi and Ale for being part of this wonderful panel. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's uh, really wrap this up. Uh, so thanking again the African community for the wonderful vibe that we are receiving will be, and of course, as Alex mentioned, this uh, open justice uh, platform that we're working on. It's uh, the first time that we're announcing uh, that we're working in this direction publicly. So be you know proud of, uh, of this uh, news. And we are looking forward to you know, talk more about uh, justice, uh, access to justice, how we can improve justice. We'll be involving, again, of course, Alice, Madeleine for this kind of conversation and 
also other experts from the continent, but also from outside, from Europe. We, we, we want to bring in, you know, all the different point of views from worldwide because our community is worldwide, it's global, and we want this exchange of bright minds in the legal sector to, to happen. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, we'll see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Peace.